And what? What's the title of the chapter? Yeah, body metabolism and body temperature regulation. What the heck does metabolism have to do with body temperature regulation? What is metabolism? You, it's lecture time. What's metabolism? Give me one word besides metabolism to describe metabolism. Reactions. Give me another word. Processing. Chemistry. Yes? Chemical reactions. That's metabolism. Good. Good thinking this morning, people. So, what does nutrition have to do with metabolism? Correct. So what was said quite nicely here in the front corner was we take from the foods we eat the things that we need for chemical reactions. So it just makes sense that this should follow the digestive system chapter. Because we just talked about taking big things, making them small, and bringing in those building blocks so we can use them for reactions of metabolism. That is the job of the digestive system. So metabolism then has a lot to do with nutrition. They kind of go hand in hand because that's where I get the building blocks for reactions of metabolism from. Many of them come from the foods that I eat. I am an organism in which I have to go out and seek these foods and ingest them and break them down in the digestive system. I can't stick my feet in the ground and suck things up into my body that I need. I can't make them from the sun. I have to get them from the foods that I eat. So the book starts talking about diet and nutrition. And one of the things that we have to remember is that we have many different molecules to build when we talk about metabolism. We've already learned about them way back when. What are the organic molecules that I need to build or have to have for structure and function of my body? You need proteins. That's a biggie. That's a big structural thing. What's that made of? Proteins are building blocks of our body and their, their building blocks are amino acids. They're hooked together by what kind of bonds? Peptide bonds. So what do we call proteins sometimes? Polypeptides. Is this all ringing a bell? I hope so. How about the energy molecules? That can also be an energy molecule. I can break it down to make energy and we're going to talk about that in this chapter too. What's another energy molecule? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are made of monosaccharides. Very good. Those are the building blocks of carbohydrates. Give me an example of a monosaccharide. No, sucrose is a disaccharide. Glucose, ribose, fructose, galactose. You remember that? Yeah, those are all monosaccharides. And remember, what was the digestive system's job? To take polysaccharides and make them into monosaccharides to use in reactions of metabolism. So we have to bring in carbohydrates. What else? Lipids. Lipids, give me another quick name for a lipid. Fats. What are they made of? Glycerol and fatty acids. We also have phospholipid bilayers. Yes? Those are all building blocks for cellular material, structural things. Cholesterol's in that group too, right? And I need that to make new cells. I need that for structure. And I can also use that for backup energy stores as well. What else do I use lipid for? Besides for the reactions of metabolism thing. Protection. Protection around the heart. Protection around the abdominal pelvic cavity. Protection of organ systems. 
And then lastly, there's another one. Nucleic acids. Remember we talked about this. What's the last thing you ate that wasn't from a living thing? Salt was the only thing we could come up with. And dirt. Yeah, we got dirt in there. It's usually not on the menu, but yeah, you get some of it in your food. So nucleic acids to build your what? DNA, RNA, ribosomes, transfer RNA, all that good stuff. So we need the nucleotides of something else, DNA, and we have to break that down in the digestive process so we can use it in metabolism. So we have to get in all of these nutrients on a daily basis. Some of these nutrients are going to act as energy for us. Energy for what? Exactly. Reactions of metabolism. And they're going on constantly. Is there any time or any point in your body where reactions of metabolism aren't going on? No. Unless you what? Unless that's it. And even then, when you die, reactions of metabolism are still, are still going on for quite some time. So, I need all of these ingredients for my reactions of metabolism. And that's what diet and nutrition talks about. The United States diet, what, USDA, what's that stand for? My brain just went dead. Yep, thank you. Department of Agriculture. Um, has set up, and this changes. If you take my nutrition class, you'll see that changes. Nutrition is a fairly new science, and we're not quite sure exactly the right combinations that we should have of all of the nutrients that we ingest on a daily basis. That changes from year to year. About every five years, it changes. Uh, with new research and new studies and new information on the subject. But what is this? It's your food pyramid. It's kind of a guideline to getting the proper nutrition into you so that reactions of metabolism in your body can take place efficiently. So we see down at the bottom, and then this is different from when I was in school. How has this food pyramid changed? <coughs> Anybody know? <clears throat> yeah, the fats were always on the top, and that's always going to change. Yeah, we've added more of the beans and things like that because we've realized, you know, we don't just need to eat meat to get our proteins and amino acid building blocks. How about the guy running up the side? Was that there back in the, back in the old days? Because what have we also realized is very important to a healthful lifestyle. Not just getting the right nutrients for metabolism, but working all of our body systems properly with exercise to make sure we live a healthful life. So the guy running up the stairs on the side has also been added to the food pyramid in the past few years. So at the bottom we see daily weight a daily exercise and weight control. Basically, energy in, energy out. We want to make sure that that's balanced. If we don't take in enough nutrients, energy, and we put out more than we take in, what's going to happen? Your reactions of metabolism still have to take place. So your body is going to take from stores what it needs for these reactions to take place. Now, if you have extra storage, that's a good thing, right? What do I mean by storage? Yeah, lip, we tend to store our extras as lipids. Um, but if you don't have extra storage, is this a good thing? No. So what do you think you need to do? Put more in to the equation. Okay, so this gives us an idea of a healthful diet and what we should choose for our meals in any given day to try and get all of the nutrients we need for our reactions of metabolism. 
Um, lipids, those are bad. We shouldn't have those ever, right? Wrong. What do we need them for? Exactly. They're very important for us to build every, I don't know, cell plasma membrane of every single cell in your body. Kind of important. So you need to ingest lipids. Uh, whole grains. What am I getting from them? Fiber. From what we already learned, what fiber is important for in the digestive system. What's fiber important for? Moving things along. That's right. That is very important. So moving things along. And from the insides of those cells, we're going to get carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are our energy molecules. We're going to talk about them in this chapter. They're a very vital and important part of a reaction that we're going to talk about that you're just going to love called cellular respiration. And it's a series of chemical reactions of metabolism that go on in cells with the help of the mitochondria to make ATP. And ATP is the energy molecule you're going to use to drive all of these reactions of metabolism that we keep talking about. Um, fruits and vegetables. We're going to get a lot of very important vitamins from fruits and vegetables, along with some fiber as well, because they're plant material and they have cell walls of cellulose. Why do I need vitamins? Big deal. I just take one of those, go to the supermarket, get a one a day, I'm good, right? No. Why do I need vitamins? Somebody said it way back in yonder, yonder nets. They're coenzymes. The heck's a coenzyme? In order for reactions of metabolism to take place in your body, there are a lot of different enzyme systems that are going to help that happen. Now, dust off the brain cells and tell me why enzymes are important. Yep, they're going to help lower, we'll get chemistry-like, they're going to help lower the activation energy it takes for a reaction to occur. So enzyme systems are going to help me conserve some of that ATP that I'm making so that I can undergo all of these reactions of metabolism at a proper rate. Coenzymes, vitamins, are going to help with that. So I get a lot of those from fruits and vegetables. Um, fish, poultry, eggs. Why do I have to eat that stuff? Proteins. They're similar to you. You're going to get your proteins again. Am I, do, or do I have the same proteins as a fish? No, but their proteins are made of the same building blocks that mine are. What were those again? Amino acids. Now, some amino acids, many of them, I can make myself with the proper building blocks. But some of them I can't. What do we call those? Do you know? They're called essential amino acids. And where do I get those from? Eat, you have to eat them. Um, the Dairy Council still has quite a hold on the United States um, Department of Agriculture. So they, of course, get their plug in at the top. Do you need dairy products to lead a healthful life? No. You don't. I know that's a shock. Many years you've been hearing, drink your milk, drink your milk, drink your milk. What was milk made for? To make a little cow into a very big cow. It wasn't meant for you. Your milk comes from your mother, not from a cow. Do you still drink your mother's milk? No. Because no. you don't need it that long as a human. And that would be very inconvenient for your mother. <laughs> so, you don't need cow's milk. What do you get? What, what do we, what, we're brainwashed to thinking we can't go a day without milk because calcium. calcium. Okay, can you get calcium from other things? Yeah. Absolutely. Believe it or not, you can get it from your vegetables. Okay. 
one of the things that they do to milk, because it wasn't meant for you, is they add, anybody know? They add vitamin D to it, because you need vitamin D to efficiently absorb your calcium. So see, it wasn't meant for you. But it's not going to kill you. And they want you to have one to two servings a day. And then sparingly, and believe it or not, and everybody and many Mainers love their potatoes, don't they? Potato is a vegetable, not really. It, it is kind of a vegetable, but we don't want to use it as a vegetable on our plate. We want to use it as a what? As a starch. Corn? Yeah, no. There, that's up there too. Okay? So when I have vegetables on my plate, don't include the potatoes or the rice. That's no, no. Those are sparingly. Why is white bread at the top? Yeah. Um, who's a white bread fanatic? Won't eat anything but white bread. Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. What do they do to white bread? Yeah. They grind the living daylights out of the, and they bleach it to suck it. And then, because they bleached it and sucked everything out, they feel the need to maybe throw some stuff back. So now they, they enrich it. Does that make any sense? No. So wean yourself off the white. Try, for me. Go to the other side. It's good for you, okay? Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of the enriched cereals, too, is to help with vitamin deficiencies, which is a problem in this country as well because we don't eat properly. So this is your food pyramid. And uh, Again, this will probably change soon. It's due for a change soon. But this gives us a nice guideline as to what we should eat in a day to get all the nutrients we need for a healthful diet. So we need carbohydrates. Where do we get them from? Talks about it in the book. Uses in the body, monosaccharides, which we're going to talk about in a minute. How much do we need to eat on our food pyramid? And also table 24.1 on page 913 gives us a nice breakdown of some of the food sources and our nutritional needs. So we have lipids. Lids, we need our glycerol and fatty acids so we can build our own lipids. Proteins, we have um, amino acids that we need to get in so we can break those apart and use them to build our own proteins. All amino acids are needed to make a particular protein, and they must be present in the cell at the same time in sufficient amount in order to make the protein right. Now we're really going to dust off the brain cells. Remember transcription and translation? Yes? Protein synthesis? Okay. If I don't have all of the building blocks for a protein, am I going to make the protein properly? No. What was the difference between a normal hemoglobin molecule and an abnormal hemoglobin molecule? Do you remember? With respect to amino acids. One. One amino acid, wrong. Can I make the protein correctly? No. So if you don't get all of the proper building blocks you need to make your proteins correctly, can you make your proteins correctly? No. That's what the all or none rule is with respect to building proteins and metabolism. Um, also, calorie intake. What's a calorie? A little c calorie is defined as the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. 
And this is heat energy. So why are we talking about heat when we talk about metabolism? Well, it's one of the things that the reaction gives off is heat. So the calories you see on the side of your food, that's not a little C calorie, that's a big C calorie. What do we call that? That's called a kilocalorie. What's a kilocalorie? The amount of energy it takes to raise 1,000 grams of water, 1 degree Celsius. That's your food calorie, the one you look at a package for. And about how many calories do you need in a day to maintain a healthful weight? It's the same for everybody, right? No. It depends on how much energy output you have. Now, if I have two people, I have a 130-pound female and I have a 200-pound male. Which one needs more calories? The 200 pound male. How come? He's got more muscle mass, which he needs calorie energy for to run those muscles. He's got more mass in general. So someone with more mass needs more energy to function on a daily basis. So they give us, and a lot of food packages now give us, an average of about 2,000 calories. Remember, that's kilocalories for any given person. But again, it depends on the size of that person. Um, some of my nutrition students are here. Give me, you did your diet analysis. What were you supposed to have for a day? To maintain. It was like 2,500. Yeah. Did, what, what was your numbers? 24. Okay. So, yeah. Yours, 23. So, it's in that ballpark. Yes. Yes, my friends. That's to maintain your weight and to live a healthful life. You remember, you're running a nervous system. You're running a digestive system. You're running a circulatory system. You're running a respiratory system. And that's just sitting there doing nothing. When you get up and you start moving from one place to another, now you're running a muscular system. And you need energy to do that. So you need an adequate calorie intake to live a healthful life. Also, nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important to build your proteins, your amino acids, all that good stuff. So proteins are important to get into you for nitrogen balance as well. And then hormonal control. And why are we concentrating on the proteins a little bit more than we're concentrating on everybody else? As far as the book goes. Why do you think? Proteins are building blocks for you. So an, a diet inadequate in protein can affect your proteins. And we've already learned about a whole bunch of different proteins this semester. We, we talked about the endocrine system and hormones. Many of those hormones are protein-based. We talked about the immune system and immunoglobulins. And what were those? What's an immunoglobulin? Antibodies. And that's kind of important, don't you think? So remember, if you don't have the proper building blocks, you aren't going to be making your proteins correctly. If you have shoddy building material, you're going to make a shoddy building. And what's that expression that should come to mind when I say that? You are what you eat. You are. So, 
Vitamins are also talked about on page 916 and 917. There's a nice list. Do you have to memorize them all? No. Um, this diagram, before I get too far past it, shows us um, some of the essential amino acids. Now, how many essential amino acids are there? There's about nine. It did, that's debatable. Nine essential amino acids-ish. But what does your book say? Ten or eight? It says ten. Okay, so we'll go with ten. When I eat something that is similar to myself in structure, I do not have to think about getting the proper amino acids. Because if I eat a protein that is similar to my proteins, it's a no-brainer. So what am I talking about? Meat. Sometimes they'll call that a complete protein. It doesn't mean it's better for you protein. It means I don't have to think about the amino acids. They're complete. How many different amino acids do I need to build my proteins? About 20. So when I eat meat, something similar in structure to me, it's a no-brainer. I have the amino acids I need. But what if I choose not to eat meat? Does that mean I'm now unhealthy and I don't have enough of the amino acids I need? Absolutely not. But you have to be an educated vegetarian, don't you? You have to make sure that the foods that you eat are in the right combination in any given day so that you can have all of the essential amino acids that you need. So you have to combine foods. One of the um, big staples in many diets who tend to be towards the vegetarian side is rice and beans. Why do you think that's so? It, they're really good. And if you get Brazilian food in Cambridge, Massachusetts, holy moly, best rice and beans you'll ever have. Exactly, the combination of those two, because you're going to get some proteins from your grains as well. The combination of those two foods gives us a more complete amino acid grouping. So you got to, that's what you have to do. You have to become educated in your food choices. You can never eat meat and be just fine. But if you choose to be a vegetarian, it's not, I'm going to eat lettuce every day. You're not going to have a healthful nutrient intake. So you have to be an educated vegetarian. Vitamins, there's water-soluble vitamins, there's fat-soluble vitamins. Now, vitamins, very important, coenzymes. Where am I going to get a lot of my vitamins? From the foods that I eat. Many of those fruits and vegetables are going to provide you with a lot of the essential vitamins for a healthful diet. Um, if I limit fat intake or try to block fat absorption, I'm going to have a problem with absorbing and utilizing fat-soluble vitamins. There's a wonderful little pill on the market. It's called Ally. Has anybody ever heard of that one? Yeah, that's an enjoyable little diet program. That blocks fat absorption. Yes. Has anybody used it? Yeah. Little oil slick going on? Yep. <laughs> Anal leakage is one of the side effects of that one. Is that good for you, not to be able to absorb lipids? Most of us are not heavy because we eat too much fat. Guess why most of us are heavy? Yeah, we eat too much in general of everything, right? Supersize it, right? Okay. Yeah. So we have, we have to think healthful, nutritious choices 
And the other thing we have to add to the equation is what? Portion control. Do you know what a portion of ice cream is? Have you read the package? It's not the whole pint of Ben and Jerry's. Did you know that? You have to share that with a whole bunch of people. It's a half a cup. Half a cup. Yep. So portion control is very important. Now, um, eating is very important too. Not just taking vitamins in. Remember, vitamins are coenzymes. So what happens if you go in the morning? Is it, does anybody fall in this category? Oh, I took my vitamins, so I'm good. I don't have to eat breakfast this morning. Yeah. You have expensive urine. That's what you have. Because if there isn't the food there to have these enzymes, coenzymes, do their job, you're just going to filter them out and pass them. Fat-soluble vitamins, you will take some of them in and store them. But if you don't eat food with your vitamins, you have expensive urine. That's what you have. Because you're just going to get rid of them. So remember they're coenzymes. How about minerals? Why is that in there? Why do I need minerals? Things like calcium and phosphorus and sulfur and potassium and chlorine and sodium and magnesium and iron. Why do I need that stuff? Give me a couple of examples. Bone formation. Nerve impulses. Muscle contractions. Blood clotting. Well, those things are kind of important to undergo a normal, healthy life. So minerals are discussed in here as well. So that's nutrition. Now we're going to talk about metabolism. <coughs> Excuse me. That was a good one. So when I take things in, we talked about the digestive system. I have big things. I want to make them small. And we already learned um, two terms way back when. We're kind of revisiting our chemistry chapter a little bit. But two terms they first or first start to talk about under metabolic reactions is the reaction of anabolism and catabolism. Now, what was the difference between anabolism and catabolism? Catabolism, catastrophic reactions do what? Break things apart. So when we talk about digestion, the use of enzymes to break things apart are what kind of reactions? Catabolic reactions. And what do I do with the building blocks I'm left with? I absorb them into the system, I distribute them to the cells, and then what do I do with them? Talk chemistry to me. What do I do with the amino acids that I got from the cheeseburger that I ate? I can't hear a freaking word you're saying. <laughs> Probably because I just blocked my ears up. Because we don't talk louder, so the teacher can hear you. What do I do with the amino acids that I ate from my cheeseburger? I have to make my proteins. I have to take the building blocks that I got from the food that I ate, and then I have to build them into my proteins. Transcription, translation, protein synthesis. Those reactions are anabolic reactions. And in order to have these reactions go go down, I need what? Energy to drive these reactions. A reaction or group of reactions called cellular respiration and what I have up on yonder board is a reaction of cellular respiration in, believe it or not, very watered down form. 
this reaction is going to help produce the energy I need for reactions of catabolism and anabolism, anabolic, catabolic reactions. Now, catabolic reactions tend to give off more energy than they use, and anabolic reactions tend to do what? Use more energy to occur, okay? So, one of the things that's going to start this whole reaction is the use of those building blocks that we said were really important for making energy. What was that building block again? That building block for making energy. I needed to take that in to make energy. Need to eat that to make energy. Carbohydrates. But what did I make them into? Monosaccharides. Glucose. C6, H12, O6. Starts the ball rolling with respect to this reaction. So they go through stages. First of all, stage one, digestion in the gastrointestinal tract, described in chapter 23, begins the process. Because I have to take in the building blocks that I need. Stage two occurs in the, cyst in the tissues, in the cells, where the cells act like little factories. Once I deliver all of the supplies these factories need to do their job, then they can produce what, they, what it is they need to produce. If I'm at a beta cell in the pancreas, what do I need in order to do my job? So I need energy, so I have to, I have to undergo this cellular respiration reaction to make what? Insulin, very good. So if I'm a beta cell in the pancreas, my job is to make insulin. So I need the building blocks, the proper amino acids, to build that specific hormone because that's my job for a living. But remember, I also need to be able to produce enough energy so that I can do my job, so I can run my factory. And that's what this reaction is all about. Um, stage three is going to begin in the mitochondria. It's going to help make the mother load of the energy that I need through a series of chemical reactions. Well, actually not, not well, yeah, in the mitochondria. Uh, the last of the chemical reactions at the bottom is going to produce that mother load I was just talking about. That reaction is called oxidative phosphorylation. So it's a combination of oxidation and reduction reactions that's going to help me produce ATP in the cell. Now everybody remembers what oxidation and reduction is, right? Okay, what's an oxidation reaction? You remove electrons from a substance. And what's a reduction reaction? You add electrons to a substance. I know that doesn't sound right because when you say reduction, you think of losing something, but not, not this reaction. You're actually gaining electrons in a reduction reaction. So these reactions kind of go hand in hand. One loses, the other one gains. We call these reactions redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. And that's what they talk about next in the chapter when they talk about um, these reactions and the role of coenzymes in these reactions. So enzyme systems are responsible for helping oxidation reduction reactions take place. One of the very important reactions in the beginnings of this cellular respiration reaction is a reaction called a phosphorylation reaction. What's a phosphorylation reaction? Any guess? 
Yeah, exactly. I add a phosphate to something. When glucose gets into the cell, it's, it's not a huge molecule. It's big compared to an ion like sodium or chlorine, but it's not enormous. C6H12O6, glucose. So in order to keep it inside the cell so I can start maneuvering it, working it through the cellular respiration reaction, I have to phosphorylate it. Add a phosphorus group to it to keep it inside the cell. So they talk about a phosphorylation reaction and the mechanism of a phosphorylation reaction in this diagram here on page 921. Again, phosphorylation reactions are not only going to help keep that glucose molecule inside the cell so I can start to break it down in the oxidation reduction reactions of cellular respiration, but it's also going to help make ATP because typically I tack on a phosphorus to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to make adenosine triphosphate. And what, why is this the energy molecule? What is it, how do I get the energy out of this molecule? I break off a phosphate, exactly. And that's going to release energy to use for reactions of metabolism. So that's why it's important for them to add the information or give you the information on phosphorylation as well. So, one of the things that I have to do in order to phosphorylate ADP into ATP is I need a little help from enzyme systems. I'm also going to produce this help during the reaction of cellular respiration. Have I lost anybody yet? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go slow so I don't lose you. All right, so just a quick overview. Uh, back to this diagram for one minute. I'm going to use substances I get from the digestive process to feed into this. It's sort of like a little factory itself, the reaction of cellular respiration within the cells. I'm going to use the digestive, digested substances, the building blocks, to build myself an ATP. I'm going to break things apart, glucose, and we're going to stick with glucose now, but glucose isn't the only thing I can use in this reaction of cellular respiration to make my ATP. That's why everybody's at the top, because you can also use amino acids or proteins you can also use glycerol and you can also use fatty acids in this reaction as well. But glucose is the most efficient and will give me the most yield as far as ATP goes. So we're going to talk about in this chapter this reaction of cellular respiration. The first part of it is called glycolysis. And that's where I do what? Glycolysis, break down glucose into something called pyruvic acid. And it's not just a quick thing. There's a bunch of arrows there for a reason because there's a whole bunch of different steps before I get there. Then I'm going to manipulate that molecule and make something called acetyl coenzyme A. That's the molecule I'm going to need to feed into another series of chemical reactions called the Krebs cycle. And then the products from all of this stuff so far are then going to feed into kind of an assembly line, the last part of this reaction, called oxidative phosphorylation. And that's going to spit out quite a bit of those energy molecules 
that I am going to need in order to run reactions of metabolism. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about anabolic reactions, the arrows are purple, and catabolic reactions. So mo uh, is this whole thing mostly catabolic or anabolic? Catabolic. And what did I say about catabolic reactions? They give off more energy than they use to happen. So the reaction of cellular respiration is mainly a catabolic reaction. So during cellular respiration, ATP is formed in the cytosol and in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is where a lot of this stuff is taking place. Now, I can make ATP out of ADP without going through all of this hassle. We talked about it when we talked about muscles. Remember the three different ways we discussed to make ATP when we talked about muscle metabolism? We had direct phosphorylation. We had anaerobic and we had aerobic production of ATP. Remember that? Does that ring a bell? Okay. Well, glycolysis, you've heard that word before, was the anaerobic guy that we talked about. Glycolysis is the beginnings of this big reaction, cellular respiration. But glycolysis gives us energy too. So during glycolysis, each glucose molecule is broken down into two molecules of pyruvic acid, and that happens in the cytosol. Now remember, I need pyruvic acid somewhere else to continue the process. That's going to give me a couple of ATPs. Is that going to be enough? No. It's not enough for me, a human, who has many, many different reactions of metabolism to drive. It's okay for maybe yeast. It's kosher for bacteria. But anything higher than that, I need more energy to do the work that I need on a given basis. So reactions of metabolism and cellular respiration get more complex as the organism gets more complex. Does that make sense? If I have a little hut, I don't need much energy to run it. If I have a 42-story building, I need a lot more energy to run it. Yes? So, glycolysis gives us pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid, then enters the Krebs cycle, and then we're going to see some ingredients from both of these reactions that are going to be used in the oxidative phosphorylation, or another name for it, it is the electron transport chain also happening in the mitochondria as well. So, when I took biochemistry way back when, one question on my final exam was to draw, yes, that's right, draw. He gave us poster paper to draw the reaction of cellular respiration. Yes? So do you think I'm going to make you memorize all this? No. That's cruel and inhuman. And after I finished that exam, all of that was gone. So if you're a chemist, you'll need to know that. But am I going to make you know it? No. But I want you to get appreciation for the complexity of the reaction. So this first reaction, glycolysis, is what we call an anaerobic reaction. And what's an anaerobic reaction? It doesn't take oxygen to happen. So it can happen without oxygen. 
Do I get a lot of ATP without oxygen? No, only a couple. Also, I want you to notice something over here. Yeah, I get something called lactic acid. And when I make ATP, or by the beginnings of breaking glucose, which I need, because I need pyruvic acid to run the rest of the stuff, I produce this waste product called lactic acid. Now I can do, I can deal with that just fine. It's kind of a waste product that I have to deal with. My kidneys can get rid of it. My respiratory system can help me. My integumentary system does a good job too. But if I try to produce too much ATP without oxygen, I'm going to end up getting what? More lactic acid than I can deal with. You ever, anybody long distance runners or run or get a cramp? How come? Yeah, when you start using up your energy stores and not getting enough oxygen in your body to make enough energy that you need to run your muscles in the case of running, you're going to start building up some of these waste products and they can cause your muscles to cramp. So a buildup of lactic acid, trying to make too much energy using this anaerobic method is not good. One of the things I want you to pay attention to though in this reaction is these guys here. NAD and NADH these guys are the important ones in this reaction as well. And they are going to help because they are going to help bring electrons, hydrogen ions, into the last portion of this reaction, which is the electron transport chain. So these electron carriers are a very important part of these beginning parts of this reaction. We're going to meet two of them, NAD and FAD nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. NAD is good for me. Okay? Now you don't have to write it down, it's in the book. But I'm not going to make you memorize that. Um, it's got a big long name. But its function is to carry electrons. And again, those electrons are going to be carried to the end portion of my reaction. So I need those to have an efficient making of ATP. And it's nice that I get a little ATP from the reaction of glycolysis. So a couple of things we need to remember about glycolysis. A, it's anaerobic. B, it's the beginnings of the breakdown of the glucose molecules in the cellular respiration process. It's going to give us some electron carriers. And it's also, did I already say? It's also going to give us a little energy, ATP. So they talk about the different phases in your book. Phase one, sugar activation. Phase two, sugar cleavage. Phase three, sugar oxidation and ATP formation. And that's the gist of the reaction. Remember, NAD and FAD, NAD only in glycolysis, those electron carriers are also a very important part of this reaction. I need those for later on. It's kind of like when I'm working in a factory assembly line. You have different things that you need in order to do your job. And this is what we're making in these reactions of metabolism. So what's the final product, the big thing that I need from glycolysis, besides the little bit of energy I get, and those electron carriers, which are really important. What else do I need? 
pyruvic acid. Why do you think I need pyruvic acid? What's pyruvic acid doing for me? No. I need it for the next part of the reaction. So it's, as I go down the assembly line, it's whatever it is that I need to do the next part of the job. The next part of the job is the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle will start in the mitochondria. What do we call the mitochondria when we described it way back when? We called it the powerhouse of the cell. Well, how come we called it that? Exactly. This is where we're going to make the bulk of our ATP. We make a little with glycolysis in the cytoplasm, but we only make a little. So the mother load of ATP is going to get made in the mitochondria by these next two parts, or next two reactions, in this big, long series of reactions called cellular respiration. The next in line is called the Krebs cycle. Again, the Krebs cycle named or discovered by Hans Krebs is the next stage in glucose oxidation. If you look on page um, 923, this whole discussion starts off with a title called Oxidation of Glucose. And you see a reaction there, C6H12O6 plus oxygen gives us water, carbon dioxide, and then what? How many ATP? 32 ATP. So by the time I get to the end of this reaction, that's how many ATPs I'm going to make. And I'm also going to give off what? Heat. Now, why, do, why is that important? I don't need heat, do I? What kind of organism are you? You're a warm-blooded organism. You have to maintain an internal core body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Yes? Yeah, that's why you need heat. The other reason you need heat is because what happens to molecules when they get heated up? They move faster, don't they? Well, wouldn't that be nice for reactions of metabolism if my molecules could move fast enough to smash into each other to react with each other? Yes? Okay. So heat's a very important byproduct of reactions of metabolism. In this case, this reaction of metabolism is called what? Cellular respiration. So the second phase is going to take a C, a pyruvic acid that we got from glycolysis. And we're going to start manipulating that molecule to form a molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. Now in the process, I'm going to make another one of those little electron carriers. We see that up at the top. NAD is going to suck up a little H, become NADH plus H. We're going to see him again. Then we're going to take acetyl coenzyme A and start to manipulate it through a series of reactions. Again, I'm not going to make you memorize them. Dr. Beck, my psychotic biochemistry teacher, made me memorize them but I won't make you memorize them. So, citric acid to isocitric acid, blah, 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 blah. In the process, what are we going to do? We're making more electron carriers. So we see another NADH carrying a little H off. We see another one here, NADH carrying a little H off. As we keep going around the psychotic little circle, Oops, now we meet another electron carrier. What's it called? FAD. 
and he's also, like NAD, an electron carrier. Why can't I remember what FAD stands for? I can't remember. My brain just went dead. Anyway, it's a big, long name. Um, FAD is good for me, but he's also an electron carrier as well. We'll continue along this, and we're going to actually go through it again. We're going to go two turns and do this to create those electron carriers we need. In the process, we are going to create other molecules that we need for other reactions of metabolism. What are some of the other molecules I might need for a reaction of metabolism? I'm going to make some ATP here, too. Not much, but we're going to make some here, too. And what's this? CO2. What do I need that for? What is that? It's a waste gas. Oh. Reactions of metabolism produce waste gases. What am I going to do with that CO2? It's going to go through the circulatory system. I'm going to carry it out and deliver it in my out breath into the atmosphere. So this is where though the CO2 comes from, from the tissues. Of course, I used what to help make this? Oxygen. That's why I need that respiratory gas. That's why that's important for reactions of metabolism, especially for this reaction of metabolism. So waste gases like carbon dioxide. Another waste we're going to see, which actually comes in pretty handy of the reaction of cellular respiration. Anybody know? Besides the ATP, which comes in handy, and CO2 is a waste. What else? Water. What am I going to use that for? Well, water is very important. When we discuss fluid and electrolytes, we'll, we'll see how important it is. And water balance in fluid compartments throughout the body is very important. And some of the water that I get not only comes from the food that I eat or the drinks that I drink, but some of the water that I get in my body also comes from reactions of metabolism. We call that water metabolic water. Did you have a question, Jesse? Thank you, sir. Flavin adenine dinucleotide. That's FAD. Yes? So, we're also going to get water from this reaction of cellular respiration as well. So we're going to get waste products of carbon dioxide. We're going to get water, which isn't necessarily a waste product. I might use it. It might come in handy. And I'm also going to get electron carriers like NAD and FAD. And the most important thing is ATP. So this is the Krebs cycle. The last part of the reaction is called the what? It's called the electron transport chain. Before I get too um, far away from the Krebs cycle, on page 924, we see um, described under the Krebs cycle the decarboxylation, the oxidation, and the formation of acetyl coenzyme A. And these are the three main things that happens during the Krebs cycle. So the electron transport chain, this is kind of the mother load of ATP. This is where most of the ATP is produced. It's called oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain. Why do you think it's called oxidative phosphorylation? What do you think happens mainly in this reaction? 
What's phosphorylation? Adding a phosphate to something, right? If it's oxidative phosphorylation, yet using an oxidation reaction, I'm going to add a phosphate to something. And then I'm going to pass those hydrogen ions that were carried from my hydrogen ion carriers. Who were they again? NAD and FAD. And where did I make those guys? In glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. I'm going to use them now. Now they're going to dump off, those little NADHs and FADHs are going to dump off their hydrogens into these little proton pumps that are located inside the mitochondria. And when we look inside the mitochondria, there were little membranes, phospholipid bilayers, loaded with these little protein pumps. These little infoldings, and you can see that up at the top of the diagram, of the mitochondria were called the cristae. Remember that? This is where all the business takes place. So these little hydrogen ion pumps, these little proteins, are going to get delivered these hydrogen ions from our hydrogen ion carriers, our electron carriers, NAD and FAD, and they're going to pump them through this series of proton pumps. And the energy from that is going to help with phosphorylation of ADP into what? ATP. So we're going to have a little ATP production line during the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. With the help of NAD and FAD, in the last part of cellular respiration. So this is the crazy part of the reaction and the different enzyme complexes that are going to lead to the production of ATP during this reaction. So the structure of energy converting ATP synthesis rotor rings, and this is all new technology. We see these in the mitochondria. They're these little guys down here that were described in a process called chemiosmosis, the making of ATP powered by the flow of hydrogen ions through these little protein pumps. So this is what's going to power the production of ATP during this reaction. So we see the structure of ATP synthesis in figure 24.11 on page 928. All right, so you got that all? You good? Okay, wait a minute. Just before I go, here is the summary. Yes? Yeah! So this diagram summarizes all that crap I've been talking about for an hour and a half. Glycolysis gives us two ATPs. What else does it give us? We, give, we get our electron carriers, two NADHs plus that's going to feed into what part of the reaction later on down the line? The electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation. We make pyruvic acid, which is then going to be converted into what? Acetyl coenzyme A. Can everybody, follow, everybody see this? Follow the arrows, my friends. Follow the arrows. So, in the process of making pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A, what else do I do? Look at the picture while I'm talking to you. Don't pack up your books. When I convert 
pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A. I also make a couple of what? Exactly. I make two more electron carriers. I'm going to use them later on down the line for who? No Krebs cycle. Electron transport chain. Correct. So acetyl coenzyme A is going to feed into the Krebs cycle. During the Krebs cycle, I'm going to make two ATPs. See down there? By substrate level phosphorylation. We learned that in chapter muscles. Yes? I'm also going to make what? From the Krebs cycle. I already talked about the ATP. Who else am I going to make? NADH. Six of them. And two FADHs. Those are going to be used for? Yeah. All of those guys are going to feed down the line because we're going to use them in the electron transport chain. So 10 ADHs, 2 FADs are going to give me the mother load of ATP, which is 28 ATPs. So the match yield from one turnaround of one glucose molecule going through this little factory assembly line of reactions is going to be about 32 ATPs. That's cellular respiration. <sighs> See you on Thursday.